Hi there everyone and welcome to volume 2 of our series of online tutorials for students starting out A-level chemistry. This time we'll be taking a look at some of the different types of experiment and associated apparatus you will encounter while studying for your A-level in chemistry. In the video description you'll find a comprehensive list of different types of reaction that could be used in each of the examples of apparatus that we cover. You'll also find the timestamps in the video description that tell you where you need to skip to if you want to understand more about a particular type of apparatus straight away. If you would like to follow up any of these experiments or apparatus with a closer look at the science that we will cover at A-level, you can either click the I at the top of the screen right now, or you can wait until the end screen of this video, which will give you all the links to the videos you'll need. Otherwise, without further ado, let's get started. So we're going to start out here looking at two different types of calorimeter. The one on the left is often described as the direct method, and the one on the right is often described as the indirect method. For the apparatus on the left to get us started, you can see we've got a thermometer directly in a solution where a reaction would take place, held in a polystyrene cup. And we're using a polystyrene cup because it's a better insulator of heat than a glass beaker, and it causes for less heat loss to the surroundings which would affect our outcome. The associated calculation with this apparatus is Q equals MC delta T to find out the energy change, and then minus Q over N, N being the number of moles, to find out the enthalpy change of the reaction taking place. Reactions that could take place in this kind of apparatus would include a neutralization, metal and acid, or even just hydrating an anhydrous salt like copper sulfate. The calorimeter apparatus you can see on the right hand side is used for finding the enthalpy change of a combustion reaction. Since we can't just put the thermometer directly in the flame where the reaction is taking place, we have a spirit burner which burns our fuel underneath a beaker of water and we record the temperature change in the water instead this time. Some extra readings we would have to take for this apparatus would include recording the mass of the spirit burner before and after the apparatus has been used so that then we can see what mass of fuel has been used in the reaction. We would also have to take a careful note of the amount of water that was in the beaker because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do the associated calculation of Q equals MC delta T. These next types of apparatus come under the category of continuous monitoring methods. These setups allow us to constantly record a quantity associated to our reaction at time intervals like every 20 or 30 seconds throughout the course of the reaction. We would use these apparatus if we want to find out the rate of a chemical reaction. Examples of reactions suitable for analysis using these setups include carbon and acid or metal and acid as they both involve a gas being released. The apparatus on the left, which uses a conical flask stuffed with cotton wool on a top pan balance, allows us to monitor the loss in mass of a reaction over time as a gas escapes out of the top through the cotton wool. The apparatus on the right uses a gas syringe to monitor the volume of gas released and collected throughout the course of the chemical reaction. For both of these, we could then plot a graph of our recorded values against time and use the gradient of the line of best fit through our points to determine the rate of the chemical reaction. One final thing to mention about these apparatus is that you are expected to be able to draw examples of them in the exam. Now this type of apparatus is particularly important. It's an example of a distillation. Now this could be used either for causing a primary alcohol to become an aldehyde in an oxidation reaction using acidified potassium dichromate, or it could be used in the purification of organic liquids where we could do a redistillation to purify our sample. Now the distillation apparatus can be described as a heating method where any of the vapour products that are released in the reaction are cooled, condensed and collected immediately via that little conical flask that you can see on the right. The vapours would rise up out of the round bottom flask, past the thermometer, which allows us to control the temperature of the reaction using our heat source, and then as we enter the tube on the right, you'll notice that that's been labelled as the condenser. The condensing tube has got like a cold water jacket around the outside of it, and it causes for any vapors passing through it to condense and then drip down and get collected in the conical flask. 
you must be able to draw a distillation apparatus for your exam using all of the correct labels that you can see on screen now. So that's definitely something you should practice. Now also used for organic chemistry, but very rarely ever covered until you start your A-level is this apparatus and it's called a reflux. Now a reflux uses a condenser just like a distillation did. However, this time you'll notice the condenser is directly attached to the round bottom flask. What this means is any gases that try and leave the reaction vessel at the bottom, which is the round bottom flask, are going to be condensed and returned to the reaction vessel for further reaction. We would use this kind of apparatus when our reactants have got low boiling points, for example, and you'll also notice that it's a completely open system with no thermometer in the top, as that would be quite dangerous. Now, a reflux can be described specifically as the continuous heating and reheating of a substance where all vapor products released are condensed and returned to the reaction vessel for further reaction. And it's used for various different reactions in organic chemistry, which can include nitration of benzene, but also it could include oxidizing a secondary alcohol to a ketone. Again, like the distillation, it's definitely an apparatus that you need to be able to draw for your chemistry exam. And so much like the gas collection, the distillation, this reflux is something that you should get practicing with pen and paper. Now, what we've got on screen now is something that you wouldn't be expected to draw for the examination, but you definitely need to know a lot about. It's the titrations. Now, for a titration, we use a wide range of equipment, which includes, as you can see on screen now, a burette, conical flask, some indicator, a pipette, and very often a volumetric flask as well. I want to start talking about the burette to begin with and you'll notice I've drawn the burette three different times and it's because what I want to focus on is how we use the tap at the bottom of the burette to control the amount of solution that passes through. You can see on the left hand side I've labelled up the tap as being open and it's when the tap is in line with the actual burette column. As we start to turn the tap, however, just slightly away from this, you'll notice that the flow of solution through the burette starts to slow down, and we can actually control it to a dropwise standard, which is absolutely crucial to be able to do in a titration procedure. You can also see that when the tap is horizontal, it is then closed in our third image of the burette, and it's really important that you're able to quickly check whether the burettes are open or closed before you start putting solution in the top and before you start doing your procedure in the conical flask just underneath. Now below the burette is a conical flask, and the conical flask is where our reaction is taking place, and the solution in the conical flask got there by the use of the pipette with a pipette filler. It's normally 25 centimeters cubed, as that's the standard volume of a pipette that we would use at college. You would also need to add a couple of drops, no more than that, of indicator to the conical flask, so that you know when you've added enough solution from the burette, you'll get a color change saying that your reaction has reached completion. You've also got to be very careful with how you swirl the solution in the conical flask, because you wanna make sure that you're mixing the solution as you're adding it dropwise from the burette, but you don't want to splash solution up the sides of the conical flask as that's going to be moving your reagents out of the way and not actually participating them in the reaction. The final piece of apparatus that I want to talk about is the volumetric flask that's shown on the right hand side of the image. Now the volumetric flask is used to prepare a standard solution of one of our reagents that gets used in the titration. A standard solution is a solution that has a known concentration and we prepare these by dissolving a particular known mass of a substance in enough deionized water to make a known volume of solution in the volumetric flask. You will also notice that I have labeled the mark on the neck of the volumetric flask on the right hand side. When adding deionized water to the volumetric flask to prepare your standard solution, you would make sure to fill up to this mark with the meniscus of your solution sat on the marked line. You could even use a dropping prepare to help you do this as it's quite tough. So this concludes another online tutorial. Click the links on screen now to be taken to A-level content follow-up on any of the points that have been brought up in this tutorial. And also for volume one, if you want to have a look at the common ions, we recommend you learn when starting out your chemistry A-level. Until next time though, happy revising.